A portion of this video is sponsored by Ubico. You know, in the world of vintage phone reviews, I'm not sure it gets any more mid-aughts than Eric Lynn asking in a review for Phone Scoop circa 2007, what if you flipped over your MP3 player and there was a cell phone on the back? When Sprint announced this credit card-sized curiosity in March of 2007, the idea of a music phone was already firmly established. My first dumb phone with an MP3 player was Nextel's i870, released about a year and a half prior. Around the same time, Sony Ericsson's famous Walkman phones took off, and Motorola's infamous rocker line failed to do the same. But it was Samsung, as usual, that took the concept of the music phone to the brink of the absurd, dividing the two functions across the two faces of what globally it called the Ultra Music Phone and what we in the States came to know as the Samsung Upstage. The choice of Upstage as a name was almost certainly an homage to Sprint's very first MP3-enabled phone, the Samsung Uproar, but it would prove an unfortunately ironic moniker. Remember, this was March 2007, and Apple's first iPhone was just three months from upstaging the Upstage, along with every other music phone on the market. Fortunately for Sprint, and those of us who worked there at the time, that didn't happen overnight. Yeah, I was still slinging phones when the Upstage debuted, and I remember selling quite a few of them, especially once the Beyoncé edition B-Phone launched in October. So it was no surprise to me that someone had the foresight to preserve an Upstage on eBay, still sealed in original retail packaging. Let's pop it open and see how kind 14 years of storage have or haven't been to this curiosity. It's free! I wonder if Sprint will still honor my free ringtone screensaver or game request. Wow. I'm just, I, it is ridiculous to me how small this is. I mean, it's a little taller, but it is way, way thinner than that N95 I just played with. Yeah, dubious new, new rating on this, but maybe it's just, oh, oh, oh dear. I don't know if this is rubber, I assume this is rubber reversion. I don't know where it's coming from but this is the most severe case I have, I have seen. This is liquid. Oh, it's under there. It's this soft pad on which the phone was meant to sit, and it has completely reverted to a liquid latex state. Jaime informs me that that happened to him with the Touch Diamond. Tell us more, Jaime. It was the most horrible, gooey experience. <laughs> what do you oh, mean? oh my <laughs> God, don't yeah. shake my hand, how dare you? <laughs> oh, yeah. God, I love a new, new old phone. Drink up, friend. Uh-oh. Oh boy, this is not encouraging. Yeah, it turns out 14 years sitting untouched will kill some batteries so dead even Dr. Crusher can't bring them back. And to make matters worse, the Upstage's battery is non-removable, owing to its peculiar design. Fortunately, crying on social media sometimes actually helps. Big thank you to friend of the channel, Alvaro, who shipped me his very own old phone all the way from Mexico City. Now this is the Ultra Music F300 model I mentioned before, but aside from its higher res camera, SIM card slot, and Telcel branding, it's functionally identical to the M620 upstage. So it's a great stand-in to try and recall how this little weirdo actually worked. The answer is, um, well, very strangely. But before we get to that, I want to make a quick point. Earlier this year, I reviewed Samsung's Galaxy Z Fold 2, easily the most impressive smartphone of 2020, and part of a family of devices that I believe will irrevocably shift the course of mobile technology, once Samsung figures out how to deliver this experience for less than $2,000. And the only thing I really took issue with was Samsung's refusal to include anything extra in the box, despite that high price. By contrast, 2007's Upstage came with everything you need to connect it to your computer, an audio adapter with a 3.5mm port so you could use your own headphones with it, pretty rare in those days, a 64MB microSD card for your music, and not just a case, but a battery case that the phone could slot into in order to triple its talk time. It's a clever design. You can access either side of the handset without taking it out. And while I do remember seeing some people in the wild talking on the upstage with the leather flap deployed, you did have the option of keeping the case closed while talking, thanks to the earpiece hole here. 
And you got all that for $149 in 2007. Sure, you had to sign a two-year contract for the privilege, but that's still quite a value. Now, curiously, one of the small differences between the M620 and F300 models of this phone is the design of the dock connectors that interface with that battery case. The Ultra Music will not plug into the Upstage's wallet, so I wasn't able to bolster my battery when taking this phone out to get a little sunlight on it. Not to worry, though, it lasted long enough for me to remember how it works, which is to say, about as bizarrely as you think it does, and I'll share that experience after a quick word from my sponsor. By now, you probably know that two-factor authentication is more secure than a simple password, but you might not know that even with two-factor enabled, your accounts can still be stolen through things like man-in-the-middle attacks or SIM swaps. If you need more security than SMS text messages or authenticator apps can offer, or you're just tired of copying and pasting passcodes with every login, consider a YubiKey from today's sponsor. Security keys with FIDO support, like this, are the only two-factor method proven to prevent phishing attacks and account takeovers. Because just like the key to a door, you need to have your YubiKey physically with you in order to access your accounts. Also, just like a door key, you don't have to worry about battery power or mobile connectivity. You just plug it into your computer or tap it to your phone. Hit the link in the description and use code MrMobile10 to get $10 off any YubiKey 5 series purchase. And thanks to Yubico for sponsoring this video. Now, if the first words that come to your mind when you hear dual-sided phone are usability nightmare, <laughs> to be fair, Samsung actually did a better job here than you might expect. To begin with, you can only use one side of the phone at a time, and there's no finicky accelerometer trying to guess which side is facing up, as we see in modern experimental phones like the Surface Duo. Instead, a simple side button toggles you between front and back, with a physical lock switch above that to prevent accidental touches. Now, while the F300 here is pretty as you like it with what it allows you to do on the phone side, up to and including the browser and even the camera, I remember the Sprint version being restricted to talk and text features only. Everything else you had to flip the phone over for, and there begins my sadness. This side is first and foremost an MP3 player, but while years of muscle memory had at this point conditioned iPod users to assume this control pad must be a scroll wheel, nope. This is an early form of capacitive panel that we used to refer to as an electrostatic touchpad, which is very cool, but the way Samsung designed the interface is very not. You see, you scroll by swiping up, down, or left, right, with scrolling speed determined by how long you leave your thumb on the pad. But the phone often over or underestimates how far you want to go. To make matters worse, some areas of the pad do serve as buttons when the under panel icons are illuminated, but because it's a touchpad, there's no physical feedback at all, because we hadn't started adding haptics to touch controls yet. And then the button in the middle is actually a physical button. You know, it, it all ends up being so confusing that I even got lost more than once during the tutorial. It is weird to me that I have basically zero memory of helping customers set this up, because as I mentioned, I sold a lot of them in my Sprint days. The only thing I vaguely do recall is having to flip the thing over every time I needed to enter text. And it was just kind of bizarrely inconvenient, and that's one of the reasons I've never bought one, probably. But you know, that's just an unavoidable byproduct of the environment into which the Upstage launched. This pre-iPhone, pre-Android, spaghetti-at-the-wall, kitchen sink, choose-your-own cliché, wild west of experimentation. In 2007, there seemed to be a phone for every niche, and despite its UI stumbles and the typically underwhelming camera performance for the time, this phone did advance the state of digital music. Alongside the upstage, Sprint launched its first over-the-air MP3 download service, charging the same 99 cents per song as iTunes, and bundling in some PC music management software as well. Of course, these days, manual management of music and per-track charges sound nightmarishly arcane. But back then, the ability to download a song over the air anywhere you were in Sprint's 3G coverage area and pay for it on your monthly bill, that was powerful stuff. And interface shortcomings aside, the care with which this new kind of device was presented by Sprint and Samsung right down to the prettiest and most in-depth full-color user manual I've ever seen come with a phone, well, combined with the one-of-a-kind form factor, it all adds up to a kind of gadget you just don't see anymore. 
a memento from a time when G's were three, accessories were free, and phones were fun. One more thank you to friend of the channel, Alvaro. You folks can follow him on Instagram at the link in the description. And as always, neither Samsung nor Sprint had any input into the contents of this video. They provided no compensation in exchange for its production. It's just a bit of fun hanging out in the past, and I hope you enjoyed it. Please subscribe to the Mr. Mobile on YouTube if you'd like to see my reviews of more mobile devices from yesterday and tomorrow. Until next time, thanks for watching, and if you can't stay home, then please stay safe and mask up while you stay mobile, my friends.